Hi everyone, we're here with Jason Mott, author of A uh, Hell of a Book, which won the, the National Book Award 2021. Hi Jason, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. My first question is, uh, how much did, of yourself did you put in this book? Because we know that it's a story about a writer that does a book tour. And right now, you're a writer that is doing a book tour and, it's gonna be a, and you're going to, to be doing a book tour until November. Yeah, I think about 60 to 70% of the book is directly from my life, whether it be from the touring side of things or from my childhood and teenage years and adulthood growing up. Um, I actually think more of myself went into this book than I ever expected to. And we know that it's also a story on, uh, you know, the loss of innocence because it's, it's a story about kids, you know, and it's a coming of age story. And uh, whenever there's a coming of age story, you know, that there's a kid that loses something, you know, and, and grows up, you know. Yes, very much so. Um, children, are, children in America, particularly like black and brown children, minority children, they really don't get a very long period of innocence. Um, at the age of 10, 11, 12, when it comes to police interactions and legislation, you are viewed as an adult in so many of those spaces. Mm -hmm. And obviously 10, 11, 12, you're still so much of a child that it's kind of insane. And yet you will be viewed in a very different way. And so I wanted to have a book that talked about that brief period of innocence and how quickly it gets taken away and the impact that that has on a person, not just for a short period of time, but over the course of their entire lives. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the, you know, the, the writing of the book. And I want to ask you, can you tell us a little bit about the process of writing the book? How did the book you know, come out? When did you first have, you know, have the idea of writing the book called Hell of a Book? Sure. So the first idea of it kind of came to me in 2013. Yeah. I was on book tour for my very first novel, The Returned. It was the first time I've ever been on a book tour. I was on the road for about three months of perpetual travel and airports and readers and all kinds of things. And when it finished, I told my agent, I said, I really want to write a book about an author on book tour. And she wasn't a big fan of the idea, but I went off on my own and I wrote about 150 pages of this book that was just a story about an author on book tour. And I even at some point made it into a screenplay and it was just all comedy. So that was when the first half of the book began. The second half of the book, the discussions on race and America and identity, all those big topics, those didn't begin until the Freddie Gray incidents in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, when that happened, I have a friend who lives in Baltimore. He and I had a lot of conversations on the phone during that period about what it was like growing up with these incidences in our lives and what it, what it was meant being black in America and how we live with that and how we process it or fail to process that. And I started writing a bunch of thoughts and ideas on that topic. And then I went back and I found the section on the writer on book tour and kind of combined these two. So that part took about two years or so to get things combined together into what eventually became Hell of a Book. Mm -hmm. You were talking about the race in America and we know that the writer of the book has, you know, sees an invisible, an invisible kid. And the condition of invisibility, especially of the black body in America, is something long rooted in American society. Do you want it to reflect on that also? And let me say, not just invisibility, but sometimes hypervisibility. So there's, you know, we yes. just move between two poles, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and so what was uh, the process of writing about the invisibility and the hypervisibility of the black body in America? Yeah, it was very personal. It was something that I hadn't thought about how much it had impacted my life until I was working on the book, because you do swing with those, between those two extremes. You were either someone that the society and the American culture does not recognize, almost, as a, almost doesn't recognize you as a human being. They see you as something else. They see you as un-American. You are this thing that doesn't really exist. And yet at the same time, there's the other end of the spectrum where you are so visible because you are an outsider. You are this other type of thing that happens to live in America, that America views you as something dangerous and something to be afraid of. And so when you are out on the town somewhere and a police officer comes by, or not even just police officers, but another American comes by, a white American comes by, you are very visible. You are the intimidating black man or the intimidating black woman. You're, so you're never seen for who you are. You're either invisible to some people because you don't have a voice that gets heard, or you are this terrifying presence that they're always there, they always see you and they're always afraid of. But the real version of you is somewhere in the middle. It's never those two extremes. And that's the one that doesn't actually get seen. Mm -hmm. We see that Sue in the book, you know, gets warned by his parents about what is waiting, you know, outside in the streets, outside in reality. And that's a very interesting topic because we 
often see, you know, in movies or in uh, in books right now, in contemporary books, you know, that there's a parent, like a parent of a minority, for example, that, you know, starts a discussion with the kid, like warning him on or her, you know, about what's waiting for uh, the kid when the kid grows up. Mm -hmm. So um, since I'm also a parent, you know, and, you know, it's, it's very interesting, this dynamic of um, kid, um, a parent, you know, how do you warn a kid of what, of how many dangers are waiting for him or her in the society? I think it's different for every parent yeah. because the extent to which you warn them and the way in which you warn them is going to dramatically influence their world outlook their personal outlook, it changes who they are. They begin as this child who thinks that the world is welcoming them and they can do anything. They have this optimism. And how you handle that conversation will, in some part, it will always damage that optimism. It will reduce the world for them. How much it reduces the world for them, how much it engenders anger and resentment at the world, that is the thing that the parents have to navigate on their own and it's different for each parent. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen instances where parents have the conversation with their child at a very young age and they have a very stark conversation with the child and the child grows up and becomes angry and i've seen other incidences where it's the opposite they have a stark conversation and the child adapts to it so how do we do it i'm not sure i think a parent has to judge for themselves what version of the world they want to talk to their child about and how they want their child to engage with it not having that conversation with your children is inherently dangerous potentially deadly, and that is something you have to mitigate, you have to stop that. Mm -hmm. I want to go back uh, to the book about the title, you know, the title is very interesting, you know, it's ironical in a way, and it's it's very powerful. How did you come up with that title, and why did you decide to call it a hell of a book, which is, you know, also the name of the book, so... <laughs> so, this is... Just fiction so, and reality, you know, that kind of entangles sure, at some sure. point. So as a fun piece of trivia, um, I have never titled any of my books. Oh. Every book I've written has been titled by someone else. Oh. Um, apparently I do okay at the words between the pages, but the thing on the cover I'm not very good at. So mm -hmm. my agent calling it Hell of a Book was her decision and she's very, very smart. Because in the manuscript, the author had written this novel and it was such a hell of a book, everyone kept telling him. And so when my agent suggested that we call it Hell of a Book, I actually fought this very hard. I said, that is a terrible idea. I said that is a very, very arrogant title to have for the cover of your book. And she fought back and she says, no, this is a wonderful title because it shows the irony. It shows the discussion of how the, the publishing world and the process of making a book is a type of hell that you have to exist in and live through to create the work. And it talks about all these different topics. And so I give her all the credit for making this wonderful title. Mm -hmm. How, how um, happy were you when they announced that you were winning the National Book Award? <laughs> Did you expect that kind of uh, re you know, re public recognition? No, not at all. Um, that was the, I was too shocked to be happy, quite frankly. Um, it took me a few days to honestly find the happy moment mm -hmm. because when they, when they announced it and I won, I was just stunned and I thought it was, it was like they made a mistake. So something, <laughs> something here isn't quite the way it's supposed to be. And so everyone was calling and texting and had friends and everyone was being supportive and congratulating me. And I remember, I remember replying back to their messages and answering their phone calls and saying, oh, thank you, but not believing it because mm -hmm. it just felt so foreign to me. And the morning after the, the announcement, I woke up and the first thought that I had was, that was the most amazing dream I have ever had in my life. It's like, that's how certain I was that it wasn't real. But then a few weeks later, and it did take a few weeks, I, I just realized that I think I just won the National Book Award and I've been the happiest I've been almost ever since. It was so unbelievable, so wonderful. That's so cool. And who are the writers, you know, that, you know, that made you become a writer? Like, what do you like owe to, like in terms of like literary heritage, you know, if, the, if there's, there's someone, you know, like, Sure. I think there are, there's a few writers, but the, the top few that I can think of are probably uh, John Gardner. Mm -hmm. When I was 14, I read an excerpt from his novel, Grendel, that made me want to become a writer. And then there's William Golding, who wrote Lord of the Flies. Mm -hmm. I still think Lord of the Flies is the perfect book. And I think perfect books are extremely rare, mm -hmm. but I really think that that book functions perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, Toni Morrison and James Baldwin are mm -hmm. probably two of the other big people. Um, there's Marcus Aurelius, which is a philosopher. I, I'm a huge fan of philosophy. Philosophy guides so much of my life. Mm -hmm. And Marcus Aurelius was one of those um, philosophers that I discovered when I was about 19 or 20, mm -hmm. in that age, when you are reading philosophy at that age. Yeah. And 
it resonated with me that that sense of the stoicism of Aurelius and Seneca and people like that. It just really resonated with me. And so those are the people that kind of together built my writing ethos. And the protagonist of your book is very stoic, you know. Huh? Yes, very, very so, much so. <laughs> I'd say we're very we're, we're well, <laughs> really well philosophy. So uh, in going back to uh, contemporary America, uh, next year is going to be the 10th anniversary of the Black Lives Matter movement, you know. And I want to ask you, how is America doing in terms of civil rights? Has the work of the activists, you know, uh, you know, fully work? I mean, or at the, as the, you know, the, the goal of the activists, you know, um, in, in your opinion, work, you know, in the, in, in the long run, or it's going to be, will work in the long run? So I think it's a really complicated question. It's a great question, though. So the role of the activist is always essential. You must have activists in any health and society. Any society in which you do not have activists, it has to be an author authoritarian society. Those are the only ones that can function without activists. So activism needs to be there. Is America changing? Is America getting better? That is the question that I do not know at this current moment. America has glimpses and flashes of brilliance, almost like fireworks. They have these impulses and these just moments where they do move forward and things do get better. I think that Barack Obama was a big moment where a lot of people believe that was the final death throes of racism in America mm -hmm. and all those issues with America. A lot of people said, well, we elected a black president. We must have gotten past racism finally. Um, the black community knew that was not true. We all knew that's a foolish thing to believe because the problem with America and the reason that I'm, I'm not sure America can, will get beyond where they are is that America is addicted to the narrative that it has solved its problems. Mm -hmm. America is married to the idea that it is perfect and that there is nothing wrong with America. And that is a delusion, that is a self-lie that the country is perpetually telling itself and perpetually reinforcing. reinforcing. And there are groups in America who are working really diligently to further reinforce the narrative of America's perfection, that America has never made any mistakes. They're trying to scrub the history books of civil rights movements and anti-LGBTQ legislation. Mm -hmm. They're trying to make people forget all the bad things that America has done. And that to me is the most dangerous sign of any government, of any country. Every time historically a country has chosen to scrub the history books, it has always led to moments of authoritarian regimes mm -hmm. and totalitarian regimes. And the, the worst parts of human history occur when people began cleaning out the history books. And so when I see people in America trying to ban books from people having haven't read, trying to create legislation to further limit the, the rights of uh, women and LGBTQ and other minorities, um, those are warning bells and they are very terrifying and they're, they're continuing. They have not gone away. They're getting a little bit louder. So are we about to fall over that edge into a place where we will not be able to come back from as a country? Or will we get to that edge and finally back away? Will the activists help us finally pull back from that and maybe one day make America into a, g a great nation, not a perfect nation, because there is no perfect nation. And we have to accept that as Americans. American history needs to accept that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, and I, I lose sleep over that. I am very worried about that. I am very terrified of that. And I'm trying to, through my art and through my writing, add some voice to that and try to make people aware of that because America's at a tipping point. I think the next 20 years will decide a lot of America's legacy for good or bad. I think it will happen in the next 20 years, whatever it is. How would you judge the first two years of the Biden presidency? Is he moving towards the right direction? Was there a shift, you know, in American society? I think the Biden, president, Biden presidency thus far has kind of been, I don't want to say ineffectual, because I think that adds the wrong tone to it. But I think that it's almost just a bit of a holding pattern for America. Um, the the Biden election and the Biden presidency hasn't tipped the scales one way or the other. Um, it, hasn't, it hasn't bound the nation together in one positive belief about things. And yet it also has not cast us down into civil wars. And I don't see the Biden presidency right now leading us in either direction. It's just kind of holding space. I think the next election in particular will be a huge deciding factor in what happens next because I see a lot of groups on both sides kind of being frustrated 
with their parties. I see Democrats being very frustrated with the what they what they view as an ineffective Democratic Party and a, an inability to stop a lot of Republican legislation and inability to protect the rights of certain people. And they're really just frustrated and um, they want something different. And I also see on the Republican side of things, I see people who look at the Republican Party and who do not recognize it. They feel that the Republican Party has been hijacked by Donald Trump and by other extremists, by other far right members. And they are afraid sometimes, I think, to vote Republican. They're afraid to be attached to the Republican Party. And yet the Democrat and Republican binary is something that will never leave the American government system. So has the Biden presidency done anything to mitigate that? Have they done anything to mend relations? I think he's tried. I don't think he's been very successful. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily believe that it's his fault. I think that America is just in a, a place of tribalism and extreme tribalism now that it, it may not have ever been in before. And there needs to be some type of unifier. I'm not sure if it's going to be an event, a person or whatever, but for America to move forward together, it needs more unification. But I'm not sure what that looks like. I'm not sure how we get to that. I don't think Biden is the person to take us to that position. And I think he maybe even knows that. I think Biden was a bit of a stopgap between the, the Donald Trump's continuance. But Donald Trump has not gone anywhere. He will run again yeah. at the very next election, and we yeah. will have that, that test of identity again. again. And I'm not sure how that's going to turn out. Yeah. I have one last question. It was very interesting when you, when you were mentioning the cleaning out books, you know, and uh, especially uh, I heard that some states in the South, like Texas or Alabama, were banning books from you know, mm -hmm. schools. Mm -hmm. I know that there's been an ongoing deba debate about the, the yeah. N-word in the American yes. uh, li literature. There was a professor a few years ago, a professor, I think, of Alabama, Alan Gribben, that wanted to, that's what he called purified, you know, Huck yes. Finn, you know. So he replaced the word, um, the N-word with the word slave when yes. you're talking to Jim. So, so do you consider this um, a step towards more equity in starting from literature and then move into society? Or is that um, just a, just, you know, just a, a type of, you know, um, censorship? Like it, no, I think it is a very dangerous type of censorship. I think it borders on foolishness. And I, I'm not calling him foolish. I would mm -hmm. never do that. Yeah. But I think that the idea of scrubbing out the N-word from the history books is so incredibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because what will happen, and I, I promise this will happen, is at some point in the future, when a, because again, part of American's problem is America wants to believe it is perfect and it has always been perfect. If we go through and we clean out the N word from all the books, all the fiction books, all the history books, we get rid of the word as if it never existed. Someone down the line, some president, some far extremist president who is all about American nationalism will say, look at all these history books, that word never existed. We never use it. It will reinforce this lie that America wants to be able to tell itself that we never use that word. We never did those things. And so if we as the black community or the literary community, whichever community you would like to say has this task, if we begin by helping this out, we go back through and we start cleaning that word out from our language and cleaning it out from the books. We're helping to create this version of America where someone can say, well, America never did any of these things. Look at all their literature. Look at all the history books. Look at Tom Sawyer. That word was never there. And like I say, I think that's just, it is so dangerous and so deadly potentially to people. So for me, I'm, I believe that word should still exist. It will always exist in the black community. And we have to make sure that it stays there for whatever reason, for good or bad. I think it's a terrible how the word began, but now it is part of what holds America true to its history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.